What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Michael Krieger is the creator and editor of Liberty Blitz Creek. He's originally from New York City. He attended college at Duke University, where he earned a double major in economics and Spanish. After completing his studies in 2000, he took a job at Lehman Brothers, where he worked with the oil analysts in the equity research department. In 2005, he joined Sanford C. Bernstein, where he served as the commodities analyst on the trading floor. About halfway through his time there, he started to branch out and write opinions on bigger picture macro topics that no one else at the firm was covering. These opinion pieces were extremely popular throughout the global investment community. And he traveled extensively, providing advice to some of the largest mutual funds, pension funds, and hedge funds in the world. He loved his job, but as time passed, he started to educate himself about how the monetary and financial system functions and what he discovered disgusted him. He no longer felt satisfied working within the industry and resigned in January, 2010. At that point, he started a family investment office and continued to write macro pieces on economic, social, and geopolitical topics. That summer, he drove cross country for six weeks and ultimately decided to leave the crowded streets of Manhattan for the open spaces of Boulder, Colorado, where he currently resides. In the years that followed, he gradually recognized that his true passion centers upon writing on issues of significant societal importance given the extremely challenging times we live in. This realization culminated with his, with his losing interest in financial markets and eventually launching his website, Liberty Blitz Creek, in early 2012. Michael Krieger, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you? Oh, hey, Sad. Great to be on with you. Thanks for uh, having me on. Just, just to be clear um, for people that, that hear that, I am no longer actively writing uh, at the Liberty Blitz Creek site. I've written one post since last July when I sort of did my farewell. Um, I do have a, another website idea in mind uh, that's going to be a different, it's going to be a, a bit of a shift in, in focus and approach, but I'm still, I'm basically waiting um, for when it feels like the right time to really dive into it. You know, I, I tend to, to, to be the type of person that doesn't go into something half, you know, so if, if I, if I, if I, once I start that, I want to be really ready to write and I want to feel like it's the right time. And I, and I actually don't feel like, um, I don't feel like that that's the case right now. Yeah. I can't wait, but I'm patient and willing to wait uh, for the right time when you're ready to do that. It's, it's very interesting. The last piece about how to cancel yourself, I think in a way your life is kind of a, an expression of that. And, you know, you've kind of moved on to some different things and you're, I guess you're maybe gathering more energy and stamina for new topics. Uh, but I kind of want to dig back a little bit to, uh, you know, your your experiences at Lehman Brothers and on Wall Street and, and really dig into when you were advising like mutual funds and pension funds and hedge funds and what that experience was like. What kind of advice were they looking for you based on uh, knowing that you had written these pieces? Sure. So, I mean, my first job, you know, was, was basically just uh, sitting in a cubicle modeling, you know, oil and gas companies, basically like P&L, balance sheet, all that stuff, really boring actually, and not something that fits into my general um, personality, but it was worth it because I, I basically got to learn, you know, the basics of accounting, financial statement analysis, all these things that um, I don't use at all anymore, but <laughs> it's still a nice kind of basis to have. And it, it helped me in my you know, the next phase of my career, which is when I did go, which is what you're talking about when I went to Sanford C. Bernstein and I was this desk uh, commodities analyst. And there my role was essentially to um, analyze, you know, it was to, it was to help clarify calls that our analysts were making, you know, so, you know, the iron ore guy or the integrated oil guy or the, you know, refiner guy and, you know, sort of translate, right. Some of the mumbo jumbo that's mm. in these research reports to the trading desk and to clients. And then, you know, have my own spin on it. But the interesting thing was over time, right, I started, well, I, I've always had my own opinions, right? Like, <laughs> I've just always been the way I am. But as I got comfortable in the role and, and built my credibility at, in my seat, you know, I felt more confident to be able to branch out and talk about what I wanted to talk about. And I did, you know, essentially. And I was talking about, I mean, I was talking about fiat currencies and the Fed and gold before Bitcoin was invented. 
um, and they see it on Wall Street. So the interesting thing that I that I like to tell people that are sort of like noobs or younger people in Bitcoin, you know, is like I came from it from a totally different you know perspective. A lot of people in Bitcoin maybe uh, see the price go up and then get it buy some and then dig in, right? Um, or have a technology background. And so they're already, you know, primed to sort of be curious about what Bitcoin is. And then right after that sort of initial step into the space, they learn more about the Fed and how mm -hmm. money works, how it's all a giant scam, how it supports the global empire, I mean, all this stuff that, that now is like common knowledge in Bitcoin world. You know, I was already there, right? Like my, and there was, you know, and we, we like to give gold bugs a lot of a lot, a lot of <laughs> grief, and I get and I get it, but you know they did do they they performed a very important service that I think should be acknowledged, in the sense that pre Bitcoin the only content really out there um, about these topics was coming from the gold bug world, right? Mm -hmm. These guys who had like been since the seventies, right, talking about fiat collapse and all that, which you know had, had been a frustrating road, of course, but there was a lot of material there. Um, and then people like Ron Paul, of course, he wrote the book End the Fed, which I read. Again, read that pre-Bitcoin. I'm pretty sure it was pre-Bitcoin or pre-me getting into Bitcoin. So I was, I was like, I was, I was in a state when I found Bitcoin and got into it. I was in a state where I was, I was depressed <laughs> because because I knew how bad everything was. You know, I knew how com completely fundamentally corrupt, shady, and uh, violent the fiat world was but there wasn't a clear um path right there wasn't a clear there was there was sort of like the gold bug line which is protect yourself right get gold get silver get whatever land uh, protect yourself from the collapse that was the message right, right? Right, right it was protect yourself but bitcoin just it just flips that because it's not um it's not like okay get into a tank and prepare to be bombed. It's sort of like, okay, get into your, you know, supersonic aircraft and let's fight, right? Like right. there's a path, there's a, there's a path. There's another parallel opportunity to create, right? To, um, to, to build another civilization. Whereas, you know, I mean, with gold, you're, you're going back, right? I mean, I, I, I get that. I totally got the appeal of people who are like, oh, we need a gold standard, but you know, it wasn't a fundamentally transformative path. And once, once I learned about Bitcoin, you know, I saw that, right? I mean, it's like, like I always say on every podcast, I couldn't sleep for like two weeks, okay? And I think a lot of people thought, like I couldn't sleep because I, I kept thinking about Bitcoin and what it meant. And I was just blown away. The other thing that, um, that really got me interested too in the beginning, I mean, there's so many reasons, right? Mm -hmm. But one of them was that I am a believer in the idea that the gold market and the gold price, silver too, are fundamentally restrained in fiat dollars. They're kept down through a variety of methods. And once I understood Bitcoin and the ability to take possession of your private keys, right, is, is trivial, right? It's so easy to do it. Um, whereas taking physical possession for gold is quite difficult, particularly in long, large amounts. And if you're wanting to do it in large amounts, you're, you're talking like a nation state or a billionaire trying to do it. Right, and right. then you set off all the alarm bells, right? I mean, it's so easy to pressure. I mean, if you're, if you're a, a government leader or even let's say a billionaire and you're like, okay, you know what? I want to take, um, let, me, let me take a billion dollars worth of you know, gold out of, out of the vault in New York or London. I mean, you, know, you, you could get a couple of phone calls and probably back off, right? So right. very easy to stop. Therefore, very easy to manipulate, particularly you know, in the short term um, or medium term, really. Um, and so it's just Bitcoin was just such a game changer on so many levels that someone who was already primed um, with a sort of waiting my whole life for it to come. Right. <laughs> it was uh, it was really it was one of the most impactful moments of, of my life, for sure. Yeah, it's interesting uh, in terms of its impact. And, you know, you frame it up like maybe uh, about being about 12 or 10 years ago. You know, you, you came into Lehman Brothers in 2000. You went through 9-11 in New York City. Uh, 2008, Lehman Brothers circles back into your life via the financial crisis. Right. You leave in 2010. How do you frame up those two events? In terms of, we were talking about before, in, in terms of lies and fabrication in these markets. And, and as you were meeting maybe some of these leaders of industry, um, were, were, did anyone else ever act like the emperor had no clothes? 
or right. that these were gimmicks or sort of uh, mechanisms to rent seek? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I think one common misperception that a lot of people have about Wall Street is sort of like, I don't know what it's like now, you know, it's, you know everything's a different world, but I assume sure. it's pretty similar. Everyone there is so siloed, they're not thinking about these macro issues at all, right? So when I'm an energy analyst in my cubicle, I'm getting paid a good amount of money and I'm in finance, I'm on Wall Street, but all I'm doing is looking at Chevron's balance right, sheet. Right, <laughs> I mean, right, it's like, right. or, the, or their 10K. And, and your, your life is this industry and, and, and answering client calls and all that stuff. So you're not thinking about um, the monetary system, nor are you encouraged to, right? Uh, and so my experience throughout the entire time, including when I, when I left, was that at least my coworkers, I would be saying all this stuff all the time. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. like one or two, maybe truly understood what I was saying. Maybe, right? right? Now on the client side, it was a little bit different, right? So I was saying a lot of these controversial things um, and a lot of clients did get it, right? You know, they, they, they understood. So I could say this stuff and they'd be like, yeah, yeah, I understand, right, I get it. But, you know, they, they, you, you'd hear stuff like, what's gonna change it, right? Sort of like, <laughs> like it's always been this way, you know what I mean? They can do this. Like there was mm -hmm. this, um, one, of the, one, one famous hedge fund manager used to always say, the markets are rigged to the upside. That's what he would always say, right? Like the, the equity markets. And it's, he's right, and that's via, right, asset inflation. And so a lot of these guys, the, a lot of the hedge funds, the, the the really good ones, and and you know, and mutual funds like PMs and stuff, the good ones, the smart ones, they fully understand how the system works, right? And they just play the and they just play the game, right? Right. Um, and but the interesting thing was this: at least back then, it was so rare for someone to say what I was saying on the sell side, right? Because I was on the sell side, the buy side of the people that, um, for your audience, that actually invest money, right? pensions, mutual hedge funds, they, they put money to work. Sell side is where really the research and sort of facilitation, like prime brokerage, stuff mm, like that mm -hmm, happens. Mm -hmm. So I was on that research side of things. So we're not putting money to work. Um, and so people in my seat just never said the things I said, like never. <laughs> it, would, it would just be, uh, I'll tell you why in a minute. So, um, so, so a lot of the clients liked it, right? They didn't necessarily agree with me. But they really did, I feel, enjoy the challenge of someone saying it and them talking about it. So that's why I think I would get these meetings. Like I would get meetings with people at buy side firms that nobody else in my firm could get. Not even like the, 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 the equity, you know, the market strategists could get the meetings. I was getting them because I would sit there and have conversations that nobody else would dare bring up. So it was fun. I mean, that, you know, I enjoyed it. It was fun. At some point, it just was time to go, right? Like mm. I didn't need it anymore. And it wasn't, it wasn't doing anything for me. And it was just, it was time for another chapter, right? Plus, you know, there were elements at my firm, for sure, that were overtly like, you need to stop. <laughs> you know That's what I, mean? what I was going to ask. Yeah, was there risk? At a, yeah. Was there risk management oh, yeah. in how much you could take these topics? And then how much freedom yeah. did you get when you started writing yeah. after... Yeah, so there's there's always, you know, and, and Sanford Bernstein wasn't a huge company, right? But it was fairly large. And you're always going to have that politics, right? The inter-office politics. And there's always going to be people that, that have your back and like you and people that don't want to take you down, right? And so, so a lot of people that didn't like me, because really my whole life, it's either like you like me or you, you love me or you hate me. You know, there's kind of like no, no in the middle. <laughs> and so I had a lot of people that liked me and a lot of people did it. And so... The people that didn't would use that, you know, to talk to my boss or, for, or whoever and just be like, he shouldn't be saying stuff like this. This isn't his job. Right. right. And so that, that definitely happened. But what worked in my favor and why I couldn't be more severely disciplined or really disciplined at all was that the clients liked it. Right. And that, that's who pays their bills. So that was a problem. So whenever I felt like there was heat coming down on me, I would just say to a big client, like, listen, I'm getting heat, you know what I mean? Like, if you want me to be around, you know, say something. So, you know, I, that, that's, that's sort of how that went down. But ultimately there was the carrot and the stick approach, right? And the carrot was like, if you do well, um, you'll get, you know, or you tone it down, right? You're gonna rise quicker, you can get paid more, blah, blah, blah. 
And then uh, my last bonus, I went into it knowing because I didn't listen, right? They were like, if you stop this, you're going to get paid. If you don't, uh, you know, the, you know, in, in not so many terms, right? They, they said that. And so I knew going in, there was a chance that it was going to be bad, right? Like I was going to get way underpaid relative to my value. And, and that's what happened, right? So I walked in, they showed me the number. I was like, I like laughed. And then I quit as soon as that check hit the account, like that day, because I was ready. Right. I was, right, I was okay. like, I'd been thinking about it for months that there that, that was a high likelihood this was going to happen. And I was, it was like, it was going to happen anyway. Do you know what I mean? Like it was going to happen eventually. It's certainly possible that um, if they had paid me a ton of money, I might've stuck out another year, you know, just because I was able to say what I wanted and I was getting paid. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but, but once it became this situation where I knew, it, oh, and the, the other thing that was funny is what they did was this. So my first manager there, was great, right? He didn't necessarily always agree with me, but he understood me, right? And a great manager, right, in my view, can can understand the personalities of, of each individual that they're managing and uses that to help them mm -hmm. rise up to their potential individually, right? So you don't you don't manage every person the same. You 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 need to manage different people differently, particularly in a, you know in a kind of a, a space like this. So, so, but he, he, he was promoted and was no longer my manager. And then my group had no manager for like a year. <laughs> and that was like, and people were like, get this guy under control. <laughs> um, so then they hired the absolute worst human being that you could possibly match with me. Mm -hmm. Right. This just like egghead, right. Who didn't understand people didn't know how to manage. Right. I actually think they did it on purpose. To, to, to mess with me, right? Because he was the kind of guy that'd be like, okay, let's have a meeting like every day. Mm -hmm. Every day in the meeting, I would just ignore and just be like, and be kind of rude. Just be like, I, I want to get out of here. What are you doing, right. you know? Right. And so, but there was all this tension. I just didn't listen to the guy at all. Like, like he would tell me to do something. I just wouldn't do it. So, uh, so again, it was like, <laughs> I was on the way out, right? And, uh, and, and so, like I said, I mean, I, you know, I got, I got underpaid. Uh, I was ready pretty much to leave anyway, so I left. Yeah. And what was your vision at that point? I mean, you're still, I mean, you're young now, you're even yeah, younger yeah. then. You'd accomplish a lot in terms of at least, uh, we haven't just, you know, for yourself and, and, and that arc of that career. So yeah. what was your vision and was it wide open? Right. Because that's so, a lot of power. So, yeah. so, so, so um, my perspective then was twofold, really. One was, and this was the gift that, that the crisis gave me, the financial crisis was the biggest gift in my life was that it get, what, what it gave me was it helped me take my ego down from a really ugly, stupid place to a good, healthy place. And that's because, as you mentioned, you know, I was young, I was making a lot of money, I was very successful at what I was doing. And so it got to my head for sure, 100% got to my head. And I mean, I wouldn't have liked myself. If you, if you, if you saw me then you wouldn't, you know what I mean? Like I, I'm not at all like I am now. I mean, it was, it was, it was ugly, right? I was full of myself, completely full of myself. And um, once the crisis hit, I was able to see for sure why I was getting paid so well, why Wall Street is, why all these people around me are so wealthy. It's because it's rigged for us. And so once I realized it was rigged for us, the whole appeal of it just went flush down the toilet. Because, you know, it wasn't any more satisfying an ego that was already taken down a, a few notches. And so at that point, you know, I knew that I needed to pursue life in a different way and that I couldn't get anything anymore really out of this kind of lifestyle. Because so much of the Wall Street lifestyle, so much of anything, and you see it in Bitcoin too, by the way. Um, it's just, I've seen a lot of the same things, okay? And we could talk about that later. But um, it's humans, right? It's human beings, okay? And ego is a bit, is a real thing. It's a real thing for everybody. It's a real thing for me still, right? But it's less of a thing. And so I didn't need that anymore. Like I, I, I was prior to that, it was like, I was proving something in some way to my ego. I was stroking it. I was proving that I could do it, right? Mm -hmm. The money was a validation that I was succeeding. And then it just, all that stuff wasn't validating me in the same way anymore. And I didn't need that kind of validation anymore. So I didn't have a plan, but I did, as, as I wrote, you know, think, okay, well, I'm gonna invest, I'm gonna continue to invest whatever savings I have in the markets. Let's see how I can do um, while at the same time continuing to write, 
right? So, so what I was doing at my job is I was writing emails to clients, like, like thought pieces, but via email. So I kept doing that. And then mm. what was it? I think, yeah, one day I wrote one and I mentioned Max Kaiser in it and Zero Hedge picked it up. This was like three months after I quit, maybe five months after I quit. And then it's like, boom, boom. it was on Zero Hedge and uh, Max Kaiser then reached out. It was like, hey, you wanna do an interview? And I was already familiar with him. Again, this is all pre, it, Bitcoin was around, but it was like, nobody knew what it was. You know, nobody heard of it, except for like Satoshi or whatever, and a few other people. And, and so I you know, got, got hooked up with Max and then Zero Hedge was, from that point forward, started publishing my stuff. Right, my emails. They would be on that email list, and they would start. So then I sort of started feeling like, okay, I have a voice here, right? Like I have a, I have a, I had, I felt like I had a lot to say, okay, that I felt was important, and now I had a means to say it, and so I started shifting a lot of my focus to other topics as well that I got interested in, and writing these emails, and then let's see, two years later, I started the website as I sort of continued to progress. And, and, and ultimately that point in 2012, it was interesting because I started my website the same year I got into Bitcoin. Um, that was when I decided, okay, writing, communicating, um, trying to inspire slash educate is my mission, okay? Right. And now I feel like it's a little bit like, the way I went into it then, I don't feel that same way anymore, at least for me. It's an important thing to do, right? And a lot of people are doing it, but I just feel like my particular role now is different, right? Back then it was like, hey, it was trying to shake people, right? Cause, cause it's hard to explain, but cause now we have such a sort of a mature Bitcoin ecosystem with so many people who are let's, like orange pilled, which means just aware and questioning everything, right? Like mm. that did not exist. It didn't exist um, in 2012. Um, it was a very small subculture of people. Okay. And that subculture of people often I didn't connect with other than we both, you know what I mean? Like other than all of us are just like, holy fuck, you know, this is messed up. Um, I didn't really connect with them in, in any other way. And it wasn't young people generally either. Right. Like I said, a lot of like crusty old gold bugs and all that. And like, I mean, they, they, they did good work, but it didn't feel, you know, I went, I did a gold conference uh, one time where I spoke, I think it was like 2013, 14. And I remember just being there and just being like, and then I did a Bitcoin conference a few months later and it was such a difference, right? It was like one of them, I felt, okay, the, you know, these are, these are young, vibrant, hungry people. And the other was just like, there's like old people who are just like, you know, stacking silver coins in their basement, right? It's just, it, it just was very different. So, um, so now it's great, you know, to see the fact that I have brothers and, you know, brothers and sisters in arms now, I feel like, um, not just Bitcoiners, but certainly that's where I'm getting a big pool of what I would say allies from, let's say, you know, with, with, with regard, uh, as an example, like a non-Bitcoin issue, a, not big, a non-Bitcoin specific issue is like the vaccine passport thing that I've been very vocal about. Who, who had my back there, right? Like who had my back? It was Bitcoiners, like 95% of, of, of the people that were really maybe 90, whatever, a large percentage of the people that had my back on that and were fighting are Bitcoiners. Right. That's good. Why is that issue so important to you? And, and how is it a Rorschach test? Okay, so for me, um, there's no going back, essentially, from something like that. So it, 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 it infects and destroys society from within completely, something like that. So let, just as an example, a vaccine passport, right? Let's say for going to a sporting event where um, vaccinated people can sit in better sections than unvaccinated, right? Or you know, you can't go into the store unless you're vaccinated or you can't sit in this part of the restaurant. unless. Okay, so that is a social credit system, okay? It's not, it's not, this could become a social credit system. It is a social credit system already because it's saying it's fundamentally getting humans used to the idea that if you do this, which the government and corporations are telling you you must do, if you listen to us, whether it's logical for you at all or not, and it's not for me, right? It's not yeah. for my children period, right? Um, you get benefits, right? You get to play in the lottery, in the state lottery, or you get a shot in a beer, or you get to say, that's 
conditioning, period, right? And that is putting human beings into a mindset that if you obey, you get this. And if you don't, you don't. Right. That is the Chinese social credit system. So for me, that's the wedge. Once that's accepted, if it ever got accepted, society is not recoverable in a lot of ways, at least possibly for a generation. I mean, you'll, you're stuck. I mean, you're screwed. Right. It's the sort of thing that, you know, if a social credit system got installed like that, let's say across the US, which I think is highly unlikely now, given what how it's played out, thankfully, right? I don't think I could live here, right? I mean, I'd figure out a way to go. And, right. and then the question is, where do you go, right? Is there freedom anywhere, right? Like, I mean, a lot of the places some of us thought might be okay, turned out that they were bad, right? Really bad in the, in the, in the COVID response. Right. So yeah. it's not so easy to know what to do, but yeah, no, for me, that, 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 that was, I actually think this was the most important issue of my life. And, 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 it, and, 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 and I'm glad Bitcoiners understood. I don't even know that they understood it fully, but if you have this right. And then a year from now, two years from now, that app, right. That proves vaccination is your digital wallet all of a sudden. Right. And it's the fed coin and that's what you got to spend. And then, right. It's like, and if you spend Bitcoin, you're bad, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm just like, you're weaponizing. Not only are you conditioning people to obey or you lose out, but you're weaponizing one percentage of the population against another percentage of the population. Yeah. And you don't want to be doing that. Yeah. It's such an important dynamic issue, but I, I also think it's one dot on, you know, sort of the long arc. And, and one thing I'm, I'm kind of thinking a lot about lately is cycles, whether it's like personal cycles where we you know, might want to live in a city and then we're in a different part of our life and we want to live outside the city and then pick the right place outside the city to live in. And, you know, in terms of uh, for me, you know, in, in my adult life, this arc has really been since 9-11 and sort of like the um, a massive change in, in the security state in my physical life since 9-11. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've, I, I was visiting Israel in, in 2002, and it's uh, they were a little bit ahead of us in terms of being uh, a security state around precautions. But it's, you know, right after 9-11, there were uh, armed, you know, uh, military people in Madison Square Garden or in Penn Station. And, and so how do you feel like things are going in terms of like the long arc? And I'll interlace that with, you know, it's funny, can you have Bitcoiners without Bitcoin? And I would argue, yes, that pre Bitcoin, people were about these issues, but without the internet and Bitcoin, I don't know if people would be able to stand up and connect to these issues. Right. right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great, great questions. Gosh, hope I remember those two. Okay. So let's start with the first, the security state, its evolution. I mean, this is stuff I was writing about way before Bitcoin, right? I mean, I was writing about, hey, you know, these tech companies and stuff are snooping on you before the Snowden revelations, right? It was known. I mean, pe people that pay attention, knew this stuff was going down. It was, the signs were there. We just didn't have the concrete proof, right? Yeah, I mean, this century has been a disaster for the United for these United States. I mean, just a complete epic, this like throwaway, right? 20 years um, in, as on a macro level. And 9-11 yeah. and was certainly that excuse to um, try to get us under control, right? The, 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 the people of the United States to, to change to fundamentally change the nature of the country. But not just that, I think it's to fundamentally change the nature of how we are, like the kind of people we are, how, how fearful we are, right? Like how much we're willing to give up. Like, do we even know what the constitution says? Do we know what our civil liberties are? Do we care? What is America, right? I mean, most people have no, if, if you ask most people, you know, they might be like, are you, you're anti-American. I mean, I can ask 99% of those people that say that, what is America to you? Right. And they could not answer the question, right? They can't it, answer. They don't know what they're saying. On their it's side, just, it's the winning. It's the winning side. It's the, it's it's the side that is the as is. Yeah, there's, yeah there's and no, so they're comfortable no, with the as is, and so they're like, America's still winning in their mind. And it's like, yeah, a bill. Is it a building? Is it a president? Is right. it is it is the CIA? Right? Like, I mean, you need to be able to define that if you're going to call someone anti-American, because I right. can define it um, for me, or I can actually define it. Like, but objective. also fighting for liberty, even if that's not what the the majority state is looking for, is American. Or exactly. adv advocating for liberty and freedom, or for or just for discussion or debate, is right. American to me. Even if you're of on, of course, of course, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so. Well, like I like I say to people, listen. Um, even though you know the courts often and people, or the government certainly doesn't pay attention to the, to the Constitution, it is the 
it is the law of the land, right? It, right. We never repealed it, right? I mean, it's what you right. swear to protect. So right. if you're going to tell me someone's anti-American, they're anti-constitution because that is above everything right. still. So, right. all right, but that's, a, so, so in any event, so yeah, it's been a long progression. Um, now, I actually think when you're talking about cycles, my view is we're in right now, right? Like this is it, like this is the um, sort of uh, fight. Right, I mean, the, like the because, and you can see it from like this the power elites' perspective. They are going for it, right? I mean, like big, because all the other stuff before was it was gradual, it was more gradual, it was more, uh, it was more even cautious, you could say. Now it's very overt, um, mm -hmm. and it's even panicky and sloppy at times. And so it seems to me there's a there's a the the forces that are trying to fundamentally transform this country, even more than it's been. I guess, I guess the better way to put it is the last 20 years were about softening us up and transforming things gradually, like boiling the frog. And now it's more about like, let's lock them in, right? Like, let's get them, let's get them tagged. Let's get them penned and let's just close the latch. That's what this feels like. Right. And so that's, that's fraught with a lot of risk from their perspective, because as you're like closing the gate, more people are going to are going to be like, wait, <laughs> you know, what the fuck? <laughs> and, and I think that's what's going on. Um, and so as far as the Bitcoin thing, yeah, like sometimes I really feel that Bitcoin exists, even if Bitcoin exists only to connect all of us, that's hugely important because the battles, right? Like years ago, it was impossible for, for me. If there was an issue like vaccine passports, there's no way I could have gotten the kind of support that I that I had um, this year without Bitcoiners. I mean, it just it just wouldn't happen. You know, the memes, the 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 the, the being loud, the saying I'm not going to do it. You know, it's just a certain type of person, um, and we're globally connecting with each other. And I I do have some serious concerns about some elements of you know, like I mentioned earlier, about what I'm seeing. You know, let's say mainstream Bitcoin culture, but I will never discount the allies that I have had and the and the true good friendships that I've made. Um, they're fundamentally transformative and important. And so, yeah, I I, I think that this let's call it pleb network um, that's that's forming and changing and forming and reforming regrouping, um, it's a powerful force, not just to defend Bitcoin. It's a, it's a powerful force in general. Yeah. When you think, when you talk about powerful forces though, and some of the sloppy mistakes that are happening lately, uh, I think some of the sloppiness is, is really kind of what Whitney Webb talks about, where it's more important to have the ability to cover up the crime than to, uh, to, to manage the cover up more than manage the crime. So the cover up is almost on like it's almost on purpose in our face. And, and I wonder how much more it can become a spectacle and how long this inflection point can go on. Because uh, people that are aware of sort of the lies and fabrication, this is painfully drawn out. Uh, you know, I mean, if this is going on- Tell me since, about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if this is going on since, you know, 2001, right. 2008, and even before right. that, right? these are huge forces that are, you know, not going to- uh, falter because a, a politician today that has a lot of popularity says something really silly or that can't be backed up with facts. Right. And, and, and when I look on the other side of the coin where, you know, I just did a show on like transhumanism mm -hmm. and, and when you start looking at like sort of AI and machine learning and how much other forces we're going to be up against, right. you know, I, I hope it's more than just connecting us. I, I wonder how much we're forking as a humanity. Right. And, you know, whether 2019 and 2020 is literally a, 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 a part of history where two parts of the world are going to see the world forever very differently, uh, like maybe JFK or even some right, bigger right. events than that. Sure. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, that, those are those are great um, thoughts. So and I and I have some thoughts on them, of course. Okay, so I think there's there's really two Two thing, two. There's two sort of future scenarios that I go back and forth in my mind about, um, and I'll I'll lay them out for you. And I think both either one could happen. Uh, obviously, one is preferable to the other. Uh, I what I don't think is going to happen is the worst case scenario, right? The worst case scenario is like the world becomes Chinified, right? Like everyone on the planet is uh, CBDC world, and where 
you know, in like living in these creepy smart cities and you're like scanning your irises to buy a donut, you know, whatever. Um, vaccine passports, they're injecting you, right? Any, like every six months, it's like, you need a new injection. Like, and it doesn't even matter. They'll just shoot anything into you, right? Like, that's like the, that's like the real nightmare world, which by the way, is what I think they want. <laughs> um, but I don't think that's likely uh, for a lot of different reasons. I mean, uh, you know, too many people are aware, too many people are connecting. We have technologies to go against it. The zeitgeist to me is decentralization, localism. I mean, th th that's, that's, that's where the enthusiasm is. That's where the, the, the smart minds are going. It's already happening. Um, I think the cat's out of the bag there. Okay, so if the worst case is probably not happening, um, what's sort of the second worst case? This one is plausible, okay? And it's sort of what you were talking about, the fork, okay? So in a fork situation, what you're gonna have is, you're gonna have certain countries that, and areas, right? that go all with this other stuff, right? Like they, they go with the, the social credit score, they go with the total control grid, smart city kind of thing. The places I think are most, let's say in the United States, the places that I think are most at risk for something like this would be like where you're at, <laughs> um, you know, you know uh, New York City, Los Angeles, like the, the big, big city centers where money, right? Where capital and human talent are leaving, Right. And so what's mm -hmm. left is going to be this. It's really sad. Right. But what's left is going to be this hollowed out shell of people with nothing and violence will go up. And then whoever's left there is going to be like, give me the UBI, scan my iris. I don't care. Right. And so these kind of big cities are very vulnerable to I mean, what are you going to do with all these office buildings in Manhattan? I, I still I can't figure this out. Right. Yeah. I mean, there, no, not everyone's going back to those cubicles. Like that's just not going to happen. Even from right. just a financial perspective, like why are you going to do that? Right? You can make right. more money by not paying the, the leases for commercial property in in Manhattan are not cheap. Let's let's put it that way, right? So you know that's not going to happen. So what happens to these cities? You know, like what what? It's not good. So unless it can be. So there's, so they're vulnerable, right? The places like that are very vulnerable. The most fiat kind of culture places, which I would say the big cities are, mm -hmm. are, because they're also, don't forget, linked to stuff like finance, right? New York City is just all right. finance. Or a lot of it is hedge funds and finance, which was a stupid bet to make, but that's what, that's mm -hmm. what happened. Um, marketing and, ad, right? I mean, all this fiat crap. Um, that's hollowed out. It's going to be, it's, it's already hollowed out. It probably gets more hollowed out. So th those places are risk. So, so in that kind of a situation, maybe you have certain countries, certain regions that go real free, right? Go real decentralized, local freedom, right? The, the mindset we, we Bitcoiners talk about. And then the other areas don't, you know, go the opposite way, largely because the populations that live there are so damn desperate and so, and so broken that they'll accept it. Right. And so you'll have like free range humans and you'll have caged humans right. and will and, and wow. there could be then a period of time where we're literally like it's sort of, you know, you, you know, like like the Soviet Union. Right. It was like the, the, the wall, like there was the U.S. and there was that and you, there was really no going in between. And you just heard propaganda about one side or the other. I mean, you could have a situation where depending on where you live, your experience as a human even though it's very different now already, it could be even more different, right? I mean, it could be the difference between essentially being like a, a drone kind of robot human and a, a free human. So we could really diverge. I hope that doesn't happen because I just don't wanna see such a large percentage of humanity living under circumstances like that, but it's possible. Um, and then of course, the, 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 the really optimistic scenario would be that you know, the zeitgeist of our era is so in so much propelling us in the direction of localism, and decentralization, uh, and voluntarism, right? As far as like where you, you know, what kind of rules you want to live under, um, where, et cetera, that, you know, the, the, the closed controlled society sort of crumble. So, so as let's say, let's in a positive situation, say the U.S. embraces Bitcoin. I mean, unlikely, right? Or, maybe not right now, but let's just say, right? And other countries in the West kind of do too, and it sparks all this stuff. And there's a lot more, you know, uh, freewheeling sort of liberty entrepreneurship, just all sorts of stuff, right? And China doesn't, right? It just sort of doubles down on the uh, control. You could see a situation sort of where China like falls, you know, in 10 years or something. I mean, mm -hmm. the whole thing mm -hmm. just kind of collapses because 
enough people leave or have left and they can come back and just be like, guys, like, you know, this is, what are you doing? The problem is, right, as you mentioned, the tra trajectory of the US for the last 20 years has been the opposite direction, right? It's been moving towards China, yeah. right? So that's what we need to break. So you've got China and then you've got the US, it's like over here still, it's going like <laughs> inching, 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 inching. And to me, that's the vaccine passport. Vaccine passport is like, okay, let's, let's merge into that kind of shit. So, so we don't wanna do that. Like, so if we could take a U-turn, you know, and start going the other way, then I think it's possible that, you know, that spreads and we can avoid the worst. But yeah, you know, I'm gonna tell you, I, I'm pretty conflicted. I could yeah. see either, I could see either scenario. I could definitely see the scenario where a good portion of humans are living at least for a generation, maybe under the, under that bad scenario. Yeah. I mean, a lot of things we're talking about, like, I think since nine, nine 11, the, the, the forces of the country have turned inward and are now feasting on on the people right. at home yes. because they can't feast no longer abroad through physical meat space and war. Right. And, and I think about these cycles and individual cycles and even city cycles or even uh, economic cycles like Wall Street is a New York City uh, powerhouse economic engine that might be cyclical. But also New York City was a, a cultural and social cyclical hub. I spent yeah. my whole life growing up in the suburbs trying to get in after yeah. my parents spent their whole <laughs> life trying to get out. Uh, you know, and then when I leave, you know, I go somewhere fairly similar. So you can make a choice and you try to read all these signals, um, right. you know, because the, in our media, you'll hear a lot about how bad Russia and China is for whatever it, it might be on the, the social credit score. And I wonder how much of that is deflection and, and deflection from what is happening here. You know, like in Russia, they talk a lot about oligarchs. And so maybe, you know, and so it's hard to read signals. And uh, another thing that just happened is El Salvador and, right. and Bitcoin is now legal tender or, you know, and, and this is unfolding. And I wonder, though, because I see this as a I see this as in a digital war and, and, and it's confusing because it's a hall of mirrors because there's good and bad actors using these digital signals. I don't know mm -hmm. what is, uh, who's a good or bad actor, who's organized right. or not, who's grassroots. Right. And, right. you know, at the same, and so I see a long drawn out war that I don't understand because I don't know how it's going to be fought and how I can help or, 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 or be injured. Cause you know, but at the same time, right. Is El Salvador sort of like the Berlin wall where maybe things happen way faster than anyone could have imagined without physical or even in this case, digital conflict. Yeah, so El Salvador, I mean, it's interesting. So you brought that up. Obviously, that's like the topic of conversation for everyone right now. I have, I have some, I've been quiet on it, right? Like explicitly quiet for a number of reasons. Um, and I want to see it play out, right? I, want, I mean, yeah. this is early, okay? It looks, it looks cool, it looks interesting. Um, I can, I will give you the really positive um, uh, angle first, okay? So let's do that. So the really positive angle is that, you know, this is for real and it's not going to be backpedaled. It's not going to be reversed. Um, and El Salvador is sort of that, it's an example globally of what the United States, these United States were meant to be and still are to some degree, which is a lab, right? Ex a laboratory for experimentation. One state does it this way, another state does it that way. Let's see how it sorts out, you know, with like, you know, like legalization of cannabis in Colorado, where I am, you know, they were the first ones to do it. And when they did it, everyone was like, oh my goodness, you know, this is gonna be a disaster, right? And it turned out it wasn't. And now pretty much every state's doing it, okay? But you needed one state to go and do it first. Um, so is, is that El Salvador globally, right? Are they, are they that, is it that laboratory for experimentation that then, um, the rest of the other other countries can follow and and I mean that's the that would be the most beautiful, optimistic scenario and it's certainly possible right I mean you just don't know we're in this time period right now like I said before for me 2020 to 2025, is the is the is the crunch time, yeah this is where it's going to get sorted out it's going to take years but I think by like 2025 whatever like if we chat in 2025 I think we could say okay it's probably going to look like this. OK, and by probably it's going to look like this, but probably for a generation, at least we have a sense of, of what's what. Whereas right, right now, like we don't, you know, we have some ideas. There's some signals um, we can we can assign probabilities to stuff, but it's impossible to assuredly say 
it's going to do this or it's going to do that. So hopefully that's the case. Okay. And El, Sal and, and El Salvador is just an example of the paradigm we're moving into where smaller nation states for the first time actually have this ability to not be under the thumb of, uh, you know, like explicitly under the thumb of a imperial hegemon, right? In this case, the U.S. has been that. Um, although China, of course, is trying to make inroads into Africa and South America. But um, this, is, this goes into the, my whole theory of like, we don't necessarily need another empire. People are like, well, you know, you know, it's not China can't be an empire. Well, you, who says we need a global empire, right? I mean, the whole point of, of things like Bitcoin and decentralization, localism, is that you don't want that. You know, that, that we're human beings are potentially, hopefully, more evolved now, where we don't need like that daddy empire to, you know, to set the stage for everyone. And to, so that would be the positive scenario. Whereas like El Salvador is domino number one. Uh, it, it succeeds great there. It provides um, a haven for people that need to flee their place to go. And um, that, that's the positive uh, angle. The thing that, the, the reason why I'm not just going all crazy about it yet, there's a few reasons. Some of, well, you know, not necessarily gonna talk about all of them, but, mm -hmm. but one of them um, is let's just take Elon Musk, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I never, I'm very careful to not celebrate stuff like that, like Tesla buying Bitcoin or Elon Musk in particular, because I just never, I didn't understand the infatuation with him in the first place. So when it was announced, I was like, oh, that's interesting. This, this, this seems like a, you know, a, a major turning point as far as, let's say, corporations putting it on their balance sheet, okay, in a more meaningful way. But I didn't. I still wasn't comfortable with with you know, like Musk is now this Bitcoin hero, and look how quickly that changed, right? I mean, th that's very unusual. Okay, it's very unusual for a guy like that to buy a billion and a half. I think that's what it was, right? Dollars in Bitcoin, put on the balance sheet of Tesla, accept Bitcoin, and then a few months later, start pumping Dogecoin and smack talking your billion dollar, billion and a half dollar asset that you have on your balance sheet and crashing the price. Okay. That's not logical. Okay. Right. There's no, there, there might be logic to it, but it's devious, right? Yeah. It's, oh, it's, it's devious. Right. right. So, uh, yeah. so, so, so there's clearly, you know, I, and, and by the way, as soon as he started talking about Doge, I was like, I told people, you know, a lot of things I don't say necessarily publicly that I tell friends, but I was like, this is a psyop. I was like, this feels like a psyop. It feels like a psyop to, make Bitcoin look ridiculous, right? In the sense that if Dogecoin, right, go ahead. Well, I want to know what you mean by PSYOP here in, in yeah. terms of like, let, let's define that because, uh, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it, it's short for psychological operation, right? Right, but like. So, so, so why or, or how is Dogecoin a PSYOP? Or, or, or who is a part of the PSYOP in this case? Like, or is it just. Uh, Elon right. running amok doing a psyop on his oh. own. Oh, I can't answer that. I mean, I, right, doubt right, it. right. I doubt. I doubt it's him on his own. I mean, I would just need to make too many assumptions. I mean, it Fair could enough. be. You know, look, a guy like Elon Musk, right? Because it feels coordinated between Musk, oh, for sure. Warren. But we don't Trump. know. I mean, Trump was re-platformed yes. yeah, yeah, to, yeah. to to roll out and be spoken. Yeah, yeah. But there's there's a little bit of magic in the universe in the sense that he said Bitcoin's a scam, but it's also competing with the U.S. currency. And it's like who's ever running this psyop is not <laughs> executing very well. It like glitches and, 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 and Slo yeah, sloppy, sloppy. It's sloppy, it's but I wonder how much the sloppiness is literally just being thrown in my face on purpose. Like I don't know if Snowden is on Team Freedom or on right, Team right. Non Freedom right, right, right. because maybe they rolled him out for other reasons that I can't see. I don't know who they is. Um, it's just so fascinating with Musk. I, you know, I don't know if he's got a savior complex. I think he's a PT Barnum. I don't think he's the man behind any technology right. at all. Right. But but um, okay. So let but let let's think about it. Right. Okay. So you're never going to know for sure who sure. he's who whose interests he's aligned with that may not like Bitcoin. Right. We don't know. It could be a lot of different interests. But I just like my intuition when something is off, right? I'm very good at that. Like if there's a glitch, like things are going along one way and there's all of a sudden it's like, uh, wait, that this doesn't make sense. What, what the hell is going on here? So when he started doing the Doge after buying Bitcoin 
and putting it on his company's balance sheet. Did, 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 did that, that, was, that was like, this is not just some guy being weird. This is intentional, right? So my view is that was intentional. And I think the, 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 the purpose was to take the steam out of Bitcoin, okay? Because it looked mm-hmm. like prior cycles and it looked like we were really on, on, off the races. And I think it was an attempt to prematurely try, and I think that's still trying to do it, mm-hmm. create a bear market. OK, mm-hmm. create a bear market prematurely to just squash by kind time. Of what's going on, squash the cycle. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and the way Doge works into that, if right for, from a, this is why it's a, I think it's a psyop from a human perspective. Right. A normie. Right. Your average person. OK, who doesn't it's not me mm-hmm. and you, but just the, right, doesn't pay that much attention to cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin at all. Or that's their anything, signal or anything in the world. Right. Yeah. But here's what they're going to think. OK. Dogecoin, which is nothing, right? It's a joke. He takes it from a cent to, I think the high was 70 cents, okay? This gigantic market cap based on one guy who's tweeting memes, okay? So the normie mind is going to say, is going to then associate Bitcoin with that and -hmm. say, see, that's what happened with Bitcoin. That's all Mm -hmm. it is. It was just a bunch of guys on the internet who just said it was good, so buy it. So, so that if you're in the normie mind, you're equating Dogecoin and Bitcoin. They're the same. Oh, look, if you can do it to Dogecoin, then Bitcoin's a joke. Right? It just it makes the whole space makes Bitcoin look stupid, right? Yeah. It makes it look like clownish because look yeah. what you can do. see. What I mean? So that's what I think the intent was. And there's there's there is no doubt in my mind that that was malicious. Okay, yeah. a lot of people are like he's just a weird guy and it's ego and yeah sure the ego is there sociopathy is there narcissism is there that's why he can be captured by some right i mean you know what i'm saying like the reason elon musk is likely captured in some way okay by i don't know which country uh agency uh other billionaires like Maybe, maybe willing, willingly, right? Mm-hmm, maybe, maybe mm-hmm. he wants to. Be. Maybe it doesn't mean it's he's like blackmailed. I mean, he might just be like, you know, him and a bunch of powerful people are like, we run this shit, right? Right, right. <laughs> Not the plebs. We we run it, right? Right, right. And so that was just him exercising his. No, no, no. You don't run this. We run this. And let me show you what I'm going to do to Dogecoin, right? Yeah. That's what I, you know, without without knowing the specifics. Yep. That's generally speaking what I think happened i we're on the exact same page and you know you though what i what when you see that though you wonder how much that's happening everywhere else and i do think it's happening yeah. everywhere else yeah. and, and so i you almost use like a lot of the that sort of signal as noise and you can do the opposite of um but those are really powerful forces working against us what i right. love about bitcoin is i can now uh ignore all of that I, I don't have to always, I can go down those rabbit holes by choice. I, I can explore and noodle, but I don't have to necessarily find truth because uh, I have this way to, uh, I have an out and I have a way to protect myself. And, and even what's been amazing about Bitcoin um, is it, it goes further than, you know, the number go up or gains, because it's not like I just found a way to make more money. I don't think I would go to my friends and be like, wow, I found this incredible checking account or savings right. account or you know, and it's going to help us solve this inflation problem. We wouldn't sit around and talk about it, uh, how it affects our lives in different ways. But uh, part of me just wants to opt out completely uh, because I don't know how much I can fight those those tsunamis and tidal waves. And if people haven't woken up by now, I don't I don't know if they'll ever really come around in mass. OK, so uh, to, yeah, I, I actually address this quite often. OK, so a few ways to think about it. Um, first pick your battles. Okay. So, so just opting out, I don't think is, uh, enough, um, or you can opt out with other things. So for example, the vaccine passport, right? Okay. So what did I say? I took it very seriously for the reasons I mentioned, but I was very vocal in saying, I will not comply, right? Like under no circumstances, Mm -hmm. will I take the shot against my will? Okay. That's a powerful thing to say. And I think people need to be saying stuff like that more. And I think because so many people took that attitude is why it kind of gotten reversed in a lot of places. I mean, even Israel scrapped theirs, which was crazy because they went all in with the green pass. And that was nuts that, that they reversed on that. So, you know, it matters, right? It matters saying drawing the line, you don't draw the line at every little thing, right? But there are things you need to be drawing the line for, right? You need to be saying, I am not going along with this. 
And for me, vaccine passports was one of those things. And if humans are going to be free, we need to be willing to say that. Okay. And if that means leaving the country, that means leaving there, you know what I mean? To, to not comply ultimately, then, then, then you better be prepared to do it. So I think that's important. Now, now I do agree with you though. And that's why I don't even write right now. And that's like back 10 years ago, it was like every issue. I got to fight this. I got to write an article. Mm-hmm, about it. Mm-hmm. Now it's like, I'm more chill. And, you know, I'm explaining on Twitter, right. My views, but I'm also, um, picking my spots, right. Picking my, picking the battles that, that I'm going to fight. So it's going to be a big thing. It's going to have to be something really big that I feel like we need to, we need to stop this right now, or otherwise, you know, I'm focused on my family, myself, you know what I mean? Like how I am as mm-hmm. a person, um, et cetera. Um, but, but yeah, so I mean, that's, oh, as far as the powerful forces, I mean, you're right, okay? But to be optimistic, they have to lie constantly, right? The, the lies on top of lies on top of lies on top of lies. And it feels to me like, like okay, did you see how the, the CDC is now no longer tracking mm-hmm. vac- vaccinated people that get COVID? I, I saw <laughs> your tweet. It's hilarious from an accounting perspective. <laughs> I mean, just... Scientific last method. Year, right. Last year, every case, right? Even like asymptomatic cases were like used to lock down. Right. Every little case mattered, but now right. they don't matter. Okay. So what I'm saying is like these lies are so pathetic that I'm up, I'm up, I'm encouraged, man. Like I'm encouraged because they they're they're they've dug themselves in such a deep hole. And Bitcoin is also so expo- it exposes, right? Mm-hmm. So well. Like like another another optimistic thing was Elizabeth Warren's thing yesterday last night where she talked about Bitcoin just lied for like seven minutes straight like just complete like di- they were so clownish she was like every purchase or sale of Bitcoin this is what she said she said every purchase or sale like if you're buying <laughs> it consumes more energy than a, than the average household in a month that's what right. she said I mean what I mean I'm glad she said it you know what I mean you know what I mean I'm like right. I'm glad she, she, but see she's it's interesting willing I, to say that. I see this as, a, a, in the broader scheme, a war on self-interest, uh, a war on what they're going to call selfishness. So right. any energy consumption you use is wrong. And, right. you know, whether it's uh, eating meat or right. it's just a war on our, mm-hmm. you know, our choices in that way. Uh, I kind of want to turn to gardening. Oh, sure. And uh, hear a lot, you know, I, I mean, I, I happen to love to garden. I, I don't do it as okay. much as I'd, I'd like. But I'd like to hear a lot about what 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 that's meant to you in terms of um, just what it does for you internally, but also what you've learned about it, like about cycles and and dealing yeah. with nature and and happenstance. Yeah. So this is um, great questions. I mean, you're you're like you're like you're like front running some of my future posts because <laughs> because like when I do write my my next blog, I mean, some of the some of this stuff is what I want to write about um, gardening, you know, and why it's really actually everyone should do it. I think even if you don't love love it like I do. So I grew up uh, on the 28th floor of an apartment building in Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan. Midtown. Okay, so my life was like a city rat, you know what I mean? Like uh, my nature exposure on a daily basis was non-existent, essentially. Um, you know, the playgrounds that when I was young were just concrete, right? I mean, it was like the concrete that's over there. Now, of course, as I got older, um, I had more experience. And I mean, Central Park, but nature was just not a focal thing in my life. I, I had no appreciation essentially for it. Um, and then really the, the cross country trip was a big turning point for me in the sense that driving around for six weeks, seeing the open spaces of, of America, right? Particularly um, the mountain area, so New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Wyoming, and, and you know, I didn't drive through Colorado, amazingly enough, on the trip. But um, I had I had like I had actual like spiritual experiences on that trip, um, sober too, <laughs> you know, like like where where things would happen that felt like I was on drugs um, while I was hiking or something, um, but I wasn't, you know, and. It was it was shocking to me, powerful, and it was it was from being in nature, and it was being with by myself because because I was I was on my own pretty much most of that trip. It was just me, mm-hmm. and and so um, you know not only did that make me want to move out out west, but it really it it just it changed me in a lot of ways, and I realized that I needed to be around nature more. And so, you know, then, then I moved out, then I, that, that sort of continued and I moved out to Colorado in 2010 and um, 
continue to gradually, you know, I had tomato plants and buckets and stuff. And I liked it, you know what I mean? I liked it, but no like actual real garden, but you know, a plant or two, but I really liked it. I always did it right on my little decks that I had. And then when we moved to our current place um, and I had more room, then I just dove in and I just started planting seeds and learning. And, and what I realized was something that I always had in me, which is like, I love growing things. You know, I just love it. I love the process of it. And um, I grow everything from seed. I don't buy any starts. You know, I even starting asparagus from seed, which is unusual. We'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, what, what you mentioned happenstance, right? And this is why I think gardening is actually a lot like trading or investing. And, and a lot of times, actually, I think people that have an experience in investing and trading are, are, are less arrogant in a lot of other ways, because you're always going to get humbled. You're always going to get wrecked, right? You're, because even if you're right, you can be wrong. You know, you can lose money. And gardening is the same way. It's like, it's the most, um, I, I even compare it to parenting in the sense that it's like so challenging and rewarding at the same time. And there's no, um, certainty, right? Just like life in general. So I think, I think gardening and being serious about gardening teaches you a lot about life because it shows you that no matter how much you know, and no matter how much you work at it and prepare and, and, and do your best, particularly organic gardening, right? Which is what I do. You're going to get wrecked, right? Like every single year. So, so I can grow carrots for four years in a row and have perfect success. And then one year, out of nowhere, something goes wrong. I have no idea what it is. And then you have to figure out what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's the other interesting thing. It makes you really think, you know, creatively and problem solving because there's always going to be a problem with something that you haven't seen before. And then you have to mm -hmm. sort of figure out, is it a pest? Is it the soil? Is it water? When hail comes down and wrecks your, your whole garden, right? That's been perfect. And so it helps you go with the flows. It helps you pay more attention to the cycles of nature and in tune with it, right? Like one of the things I realized that was really cool is how important timing is, okay? Like if, it, if you wanna get the best crop of radishes, let's say, when you put the seed in the ground is the most important thing actually. You know, the temperature of the soil, the temperature outside, what, what spot you're in right there. Like I found that if you miss by a week or so, or week and a half, your optimal planting time for something, right. you're not going to really get something, you know, you're not going right. to get that harvest. So you're always learning. Um, and being outside is just, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing. You know, like I, I will watch, I will sit there and just watch the bees, you know, pollinate for like an hour. <laughs> just sit there and like watch them. And I love it. So yeah, I mean, I, I really, I really recommend everyone try gardening. Not, 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 it's not about like, oh, you need to produce all your own food. I, I certainly don't. I mean, I'd like to produce more over time, but it's a really, really good way to be humbled and, 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 and learn about sort of how life is, right? Which, which, yeah. which life is like, the core thing is do your best right? Work hard, do your best, prepare, get knowledgeable, and then put your best effort. And then understand that despite all of that, you're going to get, you're going to get punched in the face. Yeah. You know? And you got to just, and you just got to live with it. Like, yeah. I mean, so last year as an example, I mean, it was heartbreaking what happened to me. I had my best, I had my best tomato season ever. Like it was, it was, it was incredible. I mean, I, I was bursting, everything was bursting. And then I took a gamble and I said, we were getting a frost. It was a light one. And I was like, I don't want to just take everything off. I'm going to give it a shot and leave it on. I lost everything. Like the whole, every single hundreds of tomatoes. It was, it was devastating. And that was like, cause I start work on tomatoes in April. So that was like April to October, all that work. I probably lost half of my freaking right. yield, but I won't do that again, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'll, I'll make another mistake, but I won't make that one. Yeah. It's so interesting. Uh, it, you know, it speaks to low time preferences and, and you know, the enjoyment of process, uh, things that literally take repetition and iteration, but like the knowledge is gained like over long periods of time. Uh, I did, I once met uh, the famous hedge fund investor, Michael Steinhardt, and, you know, he owns a lot of Egyptian art, Middle Eastern art, and then he owns a, you know, a zoo upstate in New York. If you ask him what his favorite thing to do, it is to watch his favorite tree grow um, mm -hmm. and just, you know, and 
But, you know, you're talking about growing up in New York City. I, I grew up in the suburbs in the, some of the open, what I thought were boring spaces. And, and I would come into the city and I wanted to be one of those kids living in a box on the 20th floor somewhere. Right. The city seemed so interesting, so much going on. And it's interesting how things change. I also went on a, a three month backpacking trip to the South Pacific and uh, by myself. And you kind of like, um, it, you know, it's interesting to when, when you're by yourself, you kind of really choose to do things on your own and you don't have anyone there to enjoy it with. So you never like, do you like this? It's just about whether you want to be there. And, um, but, uh, and just to kind of bring it all back though, I think that, you know, I kind of want to ask you about Bitcoin and localism and, you know, what Bitcoin means to you now. Uh, and what, what are you learning new about Bitcoin these days? I mean, the, the real, the real revelation for the, the real thing that I, I got into the change for me this year and I would say I'm more interested. I'm more into the You know, I mean, I hate using that term, but I gotcha. let's say Bitcoin, Twitter. I'm more into it now than I've ever been. Okay, like last cycle, I wasn't that. You know, it was just a lot of like, oh, we meet, you know, and stuff like that, and, and it was fine, right? And the UASF that was so important, that was crucial. But I didn't play. You know, I played no role in that. It wasn't my you know, there wasn't my expertise and, you know, so I sort of just watched, but I'm a little bit more in, 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 I guess, Bitcoin Twitter now, and I have more like personal relationships there now. Um, and that's been the, the best thing for me. What, what I, what mm -hmm. I did not truly appreciate and had not truly impacted my life in prior years was the, like the, the, the pleb network and, and the fact that I found so many allies with that issue that was so important to me that there were so many people that that heard my passion on vaccine passports and took the time to listen and then took the time to support my message or even just say, hey, I'm with you. You know what I mean? Like, I agree. I think this too. That was really important to me. And it was very, it made me feel optimistic. It made me very, it made me feel a stronger connection to a lot of people out there that mm. I never known before, you know what I mean? That I never talked to. Like, so I've been spending a lot of time this year, like in the DMs, for example, um, so many people have messaged me. And so I'm taking my time to, you know, talk to people and say, Hey, you know, like get to know and to get to know personally. I mean, I've gotten to know on a, in some cases I've like good, good friends that I did not have last year right? Through Bitcoin. And in other cases, just sort of like marginal friends that I like, you know, and that didn't really happen before. So to me, the the sort of camaraderie not about price go up right this is nothing to do with that right the, the camaraderie around people who have some some courage have some ethical grounding and share this passion for bitcoin to me there's just like this transcending this like transcendence that happened that went beyond bitcoin into other facets of freedom and liberty fighting that I experienced this year, and I and it made me more. It's made me more optimistic. You know, yeah. I, I feel like, I mean, if I was going to go to battle with any community, like be in the trenches, if we're going to fight, right? You mentioned the, the forces, right? If we're going to fight these forces, I mean, these these are the people I want to fight with. Yeah, I, in some regards, I feel like we already won. Um, right. I did get back from Bitcoin 2021. You said very interesting things about you know, large conferences and, and the state sort of like uh, surveillance. And it, I, I love kind of the intrigue of that stuff. And it was kind of interesting, but the crowd there, the energy, but also what's online uh, makes me very confident that at worst case scenarios, we've already won and we can opt out and opt sure. in. Yeah. And, and, right. and it will find each other in meat space. Um, I, it's interesting online. I, I think that the pleb network, might be a bit um, almost temporal or temporary in the sense that um, the connections will be in real life in meat space through the internet. But I wonder how much people will stay even on internet as anonymous figures uh, as this moves on and, and it permeates hopefully more of the masses and there'll be less need for um, people for, to the immune system to appear as often. So mm -hmm. I, I wonder, you know, and I think there's something magical about that. If yeah. everyone did disappear and, and uh, revolutionaries weren't needed, well, I, th I think uh, you know, that, yeah, I mean, I think that what you're sort of describing, I think about that too sometimes. Where, where it's like in 20 years, a bunch of us might get together again and be like, "Remember that? You know, remember, remember when we were doing right. that?" And now, like, everyone's doing their own thing, right? Like, um, 
all over the place. Right. Uh, I, I feel like that's probably going to be the case. Um, like there's this, there's, but, but, but I don't think, I guess what I'm saying is like, I don't think it's going to, that's going to go. I think we're early though in, in this immune system and battle um, in figuring out what that next paradigm is going to look like. Is it a forked humanity? Is it a, is it a, is it, is it more widespread a liberty? We don't know, but I do think that we're going to need this to, to be strong and powerful and growing um, for the next few years. I, I, I think it's going to be a few years, but I do think that 2020 was like the nadir. You know, I, I think we sort of like bottomed out as far as, um, just losing, right? Like kind of just like, like we, there were a lot of losses in 2020. And I think we're coming out of that into 2021 where there's like, there's a lot of, there's going to be losses, but there's also going to be victories. And that's how I feel about the year already. Um, and it, think about it, right? I mean, 2020, there wasn't that much pushback. We kind of were pushed, you know, we were, they tried to cage us in and then and they were going to let us out with vaccines and vaccine passports. I mean, that was that to me seems like it was a plan. And 2021 was like when they had to execute the the next stage, right? It's one thing to get everyone scared and put put us inside for a while, but but to do the next part, that's harder, right? And you see with the lies and the desperation, and the, I mean, it's path it's pathetic, right? And so, like you said, I mean, in some ways, it does feel like we've already won in that sense, because desperation, right? Like a powerful um, despot or, or leader is like you're not going to want to, you know, you, you you're going to want to want to be easy, you know what I mean? You're gonna, you're not going to want to have to like do all this stuff. You're just going to want to be uh, have it come easy, and it's clearly not. And so um, there's pushback this year, right? There's there's pathetic lies and they're piling lies on lies and lies. And so I think what we're gonna do is like in 2022, we'll look back in 2021 and say, tough year, but better, you know what I mean? Better than 2020. And then 2023, we'll look back at 2022 and be like, even better, <laughs> you know? And then um. I think, you know, but it's gonna be, look, man, like I go through cycles in my own head where like some days I'll wake up and be like, oh, me like I gotta get out of here, you know. <laughs> like, like I gotta flee, you know. This is terrible, right? And then a month later, I'm like, well, you know, actually, it's not as bad, you know. It's turning around. We're gonna, we're gonna make it. So keep, you know, everyone needs to keep their head on a swivel, but also stay grounded, right? Like, don't, don't be, don't succumb to the fear, you know. Like, stand tall, be strong, be a good person. Um, we have tools, right? We have, we have tools to make this a better world. Too many of us, in my opinion, are, are awake and non-compromising, right? That's the key. That's what I love about so many Bitcoiners. It's not, mm. it's not, it's it's that they're just like these, like, like me in a lot of ways, like just stubborn, right? Just like they're not going to just go with the flow. You know, it's like that personality that just won't stop. <laughs> yeah. right? it's, like, it's like, and it can be infuriating. You can just imagine these, like the, 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 the power elite just being like, uh, but if not for these pesky Bitcoiners like Scooby Doo or something, because um, <laughs> because we're just just hard headed, difficult people, right? Yeah. And, and, good, and good people too. But um, you know, it's it's there's a lot to be optimistic about. But don't let your guard down. Like I said, I mean, I think it's going to be. I think we're going to be in the trenches for a few years. Yeah, uh, you know, I think you know, I was really excited for this conversation in terms of being fellow New Yorkers. I think there's a bit of a you can't tell me nothing just in New Yorkers as well. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I do think we live in this complete era of relativism, relativism, and I think you were the one who summed it up on, on your talk with Ballas. And, you know, so when I look at uh, Bitcoin, I see a couple of things. One, you know, you could speak about in, uh, inflation and we were talking about, you know, maybe forces uh, making Bitcoin bearish right now or putting it in a bearish market, dampening and depressing Fine. the price. Yeah. And, and there's a part of me that wonders, I, I would have almost expected the opposite side of the coin where those forces want to maybe export all inflation into Bitcoin. So it doesn't appear in, in a lot of other sure. asset classes. And maybe that could be like their way they're allied. Uh, not that there ever be allies, but um, you know, and then also with the volatility, uh, I just see that in terms of the, our, our world of complete relativism, that volatility in Bitcoin just captures the volatility in the world that's actually happening. And, and that's why as Bitcoiners, we live with that volatility um, because we're one of the, 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 the fewer groups of people that are recognizing it. Right. One of the things that I, one of the points I do want to bring up that I uh, hopefully will help people think within a certain framework that I'm thinking in is I, I think we also have to assume now, and I'm starting to assume this more and more, that there are fractures 
within uh, the elite circles, okay? And it's not this monolithic, like we must, you know what I mean? Destroy this, or we're gonna do, I think there's now, at least that's my, my, my intuition and just based on what I'm seeing, there's, there's splits, there are splits. So I think there are people that are, mm. you know, we would call elite maybe, or, or, you know, within those circles that are like, you know what? Bitcoin might be like, this is what I talked about with Brent Johnson in our interview. I'm like, if you're a smart in, in intelligence agents, agent or intelligence agency, you're saying like that, and you want to thwart China, but you think the USD is kind of on its last legs. You're, and you can actually admit that like you, you have enough of a uh, um, self-awareness to admit that you would maybe push Bitcoin. Right. Because, because look, if you could, let's just say Central America and South America. I mean, let's just say, I mean, if China's trying to make inroads with their belt and road, right. With debt, mm. right, their own debt, sure. and they're doing this in Africa. Mm -hmm. and if they're trying to sort of like take over commodity resources using their digital yuan or whatever, let's say that, right. I mean, and the USD is sort of like losing its luster. Maybe you throw Bitcoin in there and screw up their plans, right? Which it would, which it really would, right? right. I mean, you know, right. so I'm just saying now, I don't think that there's clearly Warren, you know, believes her own nonsense to some degree. Like she doesn't, she's such a statist, right? She, she's just thinking, so there's two types of people potentially within this, like, let's say elite class. There's, there, there are those who are thinking geopolitically. And if you're thinking geopolitically, you probably do think Bitcoin can help actually, because the U S is more of an open society. The U.S. is more primed to benefit from Bitcoin than China, so you would say, "Let's spread it around." You know what I mean? Like, let's 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 get other countries to get involved with this instead of running into the arms of China. Um, but then you have the people like Warren, who is just a statist, right? I mean, she's a government like we are going to you know tweak this and that, and we're going to micromanage everything, and and so for someone like that. Um, who's not even thinking, right, bigger picture, like I just mentioned, she's going to hate Bitcoin, right? Because she's like breaks up all her little plans to like micromanage everyone's life and the power of the state within, within the state. And so there's, I guess what I'm saying is like, we have to be open to the idea that there are various factions right now um, within what we would call powerful people, powerful players. And some of them may have come to the conclusion that Bitcoin helps their agenda um, because their agenda may be, like I said, to stop or or mm. stymie the rise of China. And I actually do very fundamentally believe that Bitcoin, Bitcoin is, a, is an existential threat to the Chinese society more so than it is to American society. Yeah, it's a threat to the empire of America. But if you're talking about the people, right? If you're going to make human beings, American human beings and their prospects, Bitcoin is... Like, like I know, I think Marty loves saying this, Marty Bent, like it's mm -hmm. the most American thing. It is, it absolutely is. Mm -hmm. Like there's no question that, you know, the founding fathers and whatever would have loved the concept of it. Fits perfectly yep. into their entire philosophy for, for political science. So, um, you know, so, so th this is, look, I get confused a lot. I'm like, well, how does this play into this? And how does that play in it? Right, but I think we need to be a little less black and white. And sometimes I am too black and white when I tweet about it. There, there's probably different factions that see Bitcoin, powerful factions that see Bitcoin differently, and they may be making their own moves, right, yeah. independently of one another. Yeah, I agree. I, I see the white paper as the modern version of the Declaration of Independence, and, and, and the code of Bitcoin as, or the network as the U.S. Constitution, just 2.0, sure. exported for the whole world. And for money, Jeff, yeah. It's, yeah. Like, it's like the Declaration Declaration of independence of money, basically, yep. yeah. And as Jeff Booth said on the show, if Bitcoin doesn't win, then quite simply, China does win. So, absolutely um, agree with that. Yeah, yeah absolutely agree with that. Uh, so uh, on this note, I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation, Michael. On, uh, I've been looking forward to this for a long time, and I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. So, yeah, I didn't so even great. know you were a fellow New Yorker. That's that's really funny, though. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think uh, New York doesn't have the attitude it used to, though. It, it, no, it, little, I, I don't think it has the attitude or the luster. Uh, no. I, I used to leave, I used to feel like if I was leaving New York, I was like cheating on my wife, you know, right. like just, I couldn't be anywhere else. And, and yeah, now yeah, yeah. I'm quite comfortable, you know, kind of getting away from, from the, yep. the center it changed. of the world. Yeah. It, it, you know, it changed a lot, unfortunately. Yeah. And I I'll, saw it, you saw it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I 
not for any political or economic reasons. I mean, of course, I want I just want New York to do well and I still love the city, um, you know, and I have a lot of heart for it. But, you know, uh, personally, I'm fighting other battles right now. So. Yeah, totally. This was so dope. I appreciate it so much. Absolutely. Michael Krieger on gardening, happenstance, and Bitcoin as another parallel opportunity to build another civilization right here on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. And thank you for listening. If you dug the show, make sure to subscribe, share, and learn. Stack sats, stay humble, and keep your head on a swivel and stay grounded. This is said. Peace.